Door knocking initiate! Bomb dynamically enters the room! Epic behind the shoulder door shut! Asks Hamster, hey, wanna play Xenoblade Chronicles for the Nintendo Wii? Wait, why play that one when the Definitive Edition exists on the Switch? Steps into frame and takes seat, still clutching game with nostalgic longing. I remember you bringing this game up back in episode 3. That was over 50 episodes ago! Searching for the legendary point. That was so long ago, you're a dad now. Crippling shock! Of course you want to play the outdated Wii version, you old fart. Do you want to play the downscaled 3DS port too? Dignity takes a critical hit! And do you honestly think announcing everything that you do is going to annoy me or something? Suddenly has devious thought followed by a menacing smile. Everyone, let's go! Looks like we don't have a choice! I'm really feeling it! We can definitely do this! Backslash! Behold the power of the Monado! Keep really your stinking future! Let's not lose our heads though! Man, what a bunch really of jokers! Feeling. I have no time for really small fry! Feeling. Let's press on and on and on! I could really do with a shower right now! Leave it to Heropon! Ricky's sidekicks do good! Witness my power! The ether is flowing through! Me. I'm really feeling it. Ricky's Man, what a bunch of jokers. Everyone, okay, let's really what do I have to say to get you to stop? Really what time is it, hamster? Jokers. Oh, God. Keep your stinking future. I'm really feeling it. It's Rhine time. It's Rhine time! <laughs> Xenoblade Chronicles is the result of Nintendo purchasing Monolith Soft, the team behind Xenosaga, the spiritual successor to Square's Xenogears, and the gameplay in Xenoblade largely reflects that. Monolith likes reinventing the wheel with RPGs, coming up with some great and some clunky yet still creative ideas. Fortunately, the innovations in Xenoblade were pretty unique and interesting. You'll explore a massive colorful world, or rather a colossal titan called Bionis, adventuring your way through dozens of unique locales, fighting off all sorts of fantasy creatures and mechanical lifeforms called Mechon, fulfilling side quests and leveling up both your characters and visited cities, levels, and affinity links for a whole sleuth of bonuses over time. The combat system is also unique and surprisingly intuitive. Your party auto attacks when they're in range of enemies that you'll engage freely in real-time overworld combat, but they'll also be able to unleash special moves called arts with individual cooldown meters. The combat is really about cycling through and strategizing your use of your party's arts to maximize team advantages and damage. That strategizing gets real when Shulk randomly has a vision, allowing you to foresee a devastating enemy attack. It's up to you to issue commands to the party to successfully come out on top before the foretold vision occurs. You'll also be doing all of this fighting seamlessly in the overworld where you can encounter wild threats at below or radically above your current level. So even simple overworld traversal becomes a real-time strategy challenge at times. You'll even want to go back to previous areas to challenge those powerful threats for retribution, experience, and more importantly, side quests. And even that is selling it all short. There's so much to learn and experiment with in this massive and lively open world that even after spending dozens of hours in this fresh take on RPGs, you'll still keep getting surprised with the depth and complexity in the game. Like with the Collectopedia, the gem crafting system, and character bonding heart-to-heart -heart interactions. And most shockingly of all, the Wiimote didn't ruin this game. Couldn't tell you how the 3DS held up though. But the Switch is a perfect home for the installment and loses nothing from the Wii transition. I take it back, the most shocking thing is how this incredible unique series doesn't generate much sales or attention. Seriously, what's wrong with you people? This whole game is vividly colorful and lively, and the constantly evolving various creature and character designs all look great on the Wii, and even more so on the Switch's Definitive Edition. I'm not normally a fan of the anime style in 3D games, but this game seems to straddle the line right between realism and anime just well enough to find a happy medium for me. The only real shame is that this amiibo was literally the only merch for this game before Good Smile made a Melia statue for the Definitive Edition's release. Though I would have preferred a metal face or a Monado statue, I can only think of one reason they went with Melia instead. It's because Melia is the star character in the new post-game story, and for no other reason whatsoever. 
Ordinarily, I'd want to avoid spoilers to encourage you to play this title yourself instead of having it all laid bare for you here, but considering how the Definitive Edition added a post-game story that I want to talk about, I feel like it's necessary. We'll do our best here rounding up all of this because the story is a freaking doozy. If you want to go in totally blind though, you have been warned. Eons after two massive titans, the Bionis and the Mechonis, waged a vicious sword battle, resulting in the demise of both simultaneously. Life began to spring up naturally on both planet-sized beings, biological life forms on Bionis and mechanical life forms on the Mechonis, which would eventually be locked into battle against each other on the now long dead Titan's bodies. Young citizens of the Bionis' Colony 9, Shulk, Rhine, and Fiora, tried to live a normal life between random Mechon attacks, until one day when a powerful talking-faced Mechon called Metal Face, commanding a large Mechon battalion, attacks the colony and slaughters Fiora. Devastated, Shulk and Rhine set off on a journey of vengeance against the Mechon who killed their friend. And right after I just sunk all that gold in for her new armor and weapons. I wasn't out for vengeance after losing a party member. I was shamelessly butthurt about all that cash I lost. Nice. Well, I'm already skimming over a lot considering how incredibly long this story is, so bear with me as I backpedal a bit. This story isn't entirely told in chronological order, either, as Shulk leaves the colony wielding the powerful yet mysterious Monado, that seems to be the only weapon effective against the Mechon, yet also gives him random visions of future events to come. Large chunks of the game are in discovering the context behind or trying to prevent Shulk's visions. So Fiora's older brother Dunban was the former wielder of the glorified hallucinogenic lightsaber, but couldn't handle its power, crippling his right arm and leaving him bedridden for weeks. Dunban never got visions either, and if you're starting to smell generic main character chosen one hero anime tropes, then you're not the only one. Don't forget the journeying across varied landscapes accumulating party members one as well. Long story short, Sharla, a sharpshooter medic, Ricky, a tongue-in-cheek reject nopon, and Melia, the half-breed magical princess, join the party on their way to reach the summit of the Bionis' head. He is seriously skipping over so much. Sorry, Dunban tags along too. Not what I meant! Long story short, the crew reach the peak of the floating prison island, where Shulk, questionably, decides to free the obviously sketchy imprisoned giant Zanza, with the promise of him unlocking the power to defeat the Mechon with the Monado. Ironically, Metal Face promptly appears and skewers the giant afterward, but not before Shulk's upgrade kicks in, allowing him to finally face off with the giant mech. At least mention how there were other faced mechon up to this point. And during this battle, one of them is revealed to be piloted by a mechanized Fiora. The group is stunned to see her alive, but she doesn't remember them at all. Their goal now shifts into chasing down and saving Fiora from the Mechon. So there's a war, you get her back, and- You're skipping so much! You end up traversing to the head of the Mechonis, where you defeat the Mechon leader, controlling the entire Titan like a planet-sized Gundam. Right after some dramatic backstabbing from the obviously evil guy. You are blowing by the story so fast I can't even keep up with- Do you want this to be an hour long? <laughs> so the rest of the game is a total mindful. Watch it, there's kids watching you playing with yourself here. <sighs> So it turns out Zanza was actually an evil god possessing the giant from Prison Island, and in truth was the soul of the Bionis, hidden dormant in the Monado, recovering slowly from his ancient battle, waiting for his proxy, Shulk, to awaken the Monado's full strength and restore him to life again, so that he could end all life on both Bionis and Mechonis to ensure his own survival in an eternal cycle of death and rebirth fueled by the souls of all those killed FF7 Lifestream style. The poor people of Mechonis were only trying to stop this tyrannical god from awakening and ending all life by siphoning his revival fuel source, the lives of the people of Bionis. You're the bad guys! So now you just killed off one of your only hopes of survival now that the Bionis is back in action, flinging, crushing, and dropping everyone off of itself as it attacks the once again lifeless Mechonis, with an entire war happening on its sword, by the way. Basically, everyone is doomed because of you, unless you can somehow defeat Zanza head on. So like all other good JRPGs, a ragtag group of unlikely heroes travel the world, uncover a sinister plot, and ultimately kill God. By sheer will, Shulk awakens a Monado of his own to defeat Zanza and absorb his unlimited power, and with it, chooses to rewrite the universe. But to avoid following in Zanza's short-sighted footsteps, he creates a world with no need for gods. Because subtlety. And if all that craziness wasn't enough, and believe me, we skipped over a ton of cool stuff. We get insight into when Zanza first created the universe. He was just a man in a space laboratory, performing an experiment gone wrong. 
His old world is uncannily reminiscent of Xenosaga, and here a certain character is revealed to be the remnant AI from his ship, who's also decorated with Zohars, so just saying. The story checks all the boxes for a great RPG, but with some awesome Metal Gear plot twistiness thrown in. I'd even go so far as to say that you'd ruin it simply by adding or changing anything unnecessarily. And guess what they did for the Definitive Edition? Hey, if you just want to be in the Xeno universe for longer, then this post-game story starring Melia first and foremost will certainly give you an incentive to keep playing. But this post-game story adds absolutely nothing to the game, and if anything, its redundancy seems to detract from the entire focus of the main campaign. Honestly, I was excited to see this new universe that Shulk wished into being. There really was a ton of potential for an epic story to be had here. Unfortunately, it all just boils down to racist people hating each other and Melia's half-breed nature being a middle ground tying them together so everyone can start acting like freaking adults. Bummer when wishing for a world with no need for gods, Shulk forgot to mention racism, greed, and bigotry. Now, I'm not one to complain about bonus content, but something feels so anticlimactic with this tacked on and totally pointless story expansion, especially with how epic the main campaign was. God is dead, life restored, but hatred and stupidity are forever. <laughs> The music in Xeno games is always pretty good, but this installment might just be their finest work to date. It also helps that the game is fully voice acted, although it can start to get really annoying in combat. Characters will all say different things to each other based on their special attacks, status effects, current affinity levels, and who is currently your lead party member. Honestly, if you're going to have fully voiced battle banter, that's how you do it. But would it kill you to turn down the frequency of smidge? I'm not exaggerating when I say that Xenoblade is one of the greatest RPGs of the generation. Now get ready for a chain attack, hamster! Uh, the main story was outstanding, but that post-game story was a little underwhelming. Come on, you can do better than that, hamster! But that music, that gameplay! I'm really feeling it? That's the spirit! Now land the finishing blow! It's... RIME TIME! time! The positive gamer in me was amazed with how great Xenoblade Chronicles was, awarding it with a rare 10 out of 10. It is not often when a game can captivate me for nearly as long as this one did, with its incredible blend of unique gameplay, suspenseful story, great soundtrack and art style. And if that's not worth a perfect score, then I don't know what is. The critical gamer in me was pretty amazed with Xenoblade Chronicles, giving it an impressive 9 out of 10. Now, it wasn't the Definitive Edition's underwhelming add-on, or the overabundance of combat dialogue, or the occasionally quirky music tracks, or side quests holding me back, but... Actually, actually yes it was. There's nothing like adventuring on the body of a planet-sized titan brimming with life, so to me this journey was simply unforgettable. But what do you think? Tell us how your positive and critical sides rated Xenoblade Chronicles in the comments below. But if you're underselling the series just because of its historically low sales, then you're just playing with yourself. I'm really feeling it! Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe for more, and use the links in the description to nominate future episodes. Thank you to our Patreon members Atomic Thomas, Cameron, Arrow, Ben, Rowan, Erica, Shayam, SquatFam, Sid, and Daddy. Boop.